Welcome. Today we're going to be talking about a civil war. We're going to Ethiopia and we're going to talk about the ramifications of this civil war. Welcome to the table. Welcome to rational war. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. I'm joined at the table today by Fortuna. Fortuna is an Ethiopian and she has lived in this country for quite some time. Let us introduce you to Fortuna and she'll give you a little bit about her background. Fortuna. My name is Fortuna Hailemariam and I was born in Ethiopia. I came to the United States when I was uh, young and uh, uh, the first one that I came was Washington, D.C. From there, I moved to Nashville, Tennessee. From Nashville, Tennessee, St. Louis, Missouri. Now I'm in Colorado. I was born in Ethiopia, but my parents are from the northern part of Ethiopia, Tigray. Okay. So you're a Tigrayan? Yes. Wonderful. I'm going to actually read a little bit here about the start of the war because I, th I don't think either of us could put it into better words than this. On November the 4th, 2020, now there's a date that should ring a few bells and we're going to talk about that date in a minute. The Ethiopian government and its allies declared a genocidal war on Ethiopia's northernmost region, Tigray. As military forces encircled Tigray and brutally invaded the region, the Ethiopian government promptly shut down telecommunication and internet services. The impact of the telecommunications and internet blackout has been catastrophic. Tigrayans in the uh, dysphoria have not been able to talk to their families in two years. The Ethiopian government has switched off an entire region to hide the atrocities that their forces and allies are committing in Tigray. November the 4th. Why did they pick that date? The reason why the, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, which is Abiy Ahmed, he chose November 4th, 2020, because at that time in America, it was election day. Joe Biden got elected, and he knew that the world would be distracted by the elections. I myself didn't even think this would come. I was so focused on who's going to get elected. I was getting excited. I was watching CNN, and then out of nowhere, it's just like, boom, there is a war. And he did that because he knew that they were just focused on what's going on in America. And of course, a couple of months after that, Russia invaded Ukraine, which again took the heat off him, especially with the t telecommunications blackout. Mm -hmm. Terrible. Let's talk a little bit about who's involved in this. Who are the TPLF? The TPLF are the t uh, TPLF stand for Tigray Liberation Front. They are Tigrayans. And, but it's just uh, the TPLF were born in the mid-1970s. So they were in power for 27 years. And they fought the previous regime, which is called Dirk, and they fought for 17 years. And uh, they won the war, and then they were in power uh, after that. And the TPLF, uh, the prime minister at that time, his name was Melissa Nawi and he was in power for 27 years. And he, the country actually, he developed it really, really good. And we had uh, a grow than what it was before the previous regime was. After that, uh, 27 years, 2018, the prime minister died. Uh, we don't know the cause of death. And then after that, we didn't really have anyone in power until 2018. It was still the TPLF that was running it, mm -hmm. but we didn't really have, uh, you know, a president, a prime minister. So in 2018, the TPLF left the office and Abiy Ahmed, which is now the prime minister of Ethiopia, he took power. And he, at that time, 2018, he was not elected. They just gave him. And then once he became in power in 2018, what he did was spread hate against the Tigrayan people. The Tigrayan people only make up 7% of the population of Ethiopia. So the main, the huge population is called the Oromo, and then the Mharas, and then the Tigrayan. We're like almost 7 million people. We're not that much. 
And then he starts spreading hate, saying that the TPLF are bad, the TPLF are this. He was calling us hyena. He was calling us we are losers. He was calling us a lot of things. And the Ethiopian in general, the people, they observe that. And even the people that I was friend with for a long time, they all kind of decided not to be my friends because they were party of the other tribes. He spread a lot of hate and it worked out for him because now he's in power. Why the hate? I mean, did the Tigrians do anything to upset him or is it just something that's internal, something that's been going on for centuries? During when the prime minister of the previous uh, prime minister before he died, Meles Zainawi, Abiy Ahmed, the prime minister now, he actually worked with him. So he was part of it too. So I just didn't understand what was the reason for him to do that now. But at the end of the day, you never really understand politics. <laughs> I really don't get it. So yeah, I don't have an answer for that because I don't know how politics works. Right. I don't know why he created so much hatred. I don't know why he started the war to begin with. Till this day, I still have a question. Why did he start the war? I'm sure they know, you know, inside is different, outside is different. Most of the Ethiopians, they're not educated, meaning that especially they're farmers. Mm -hmm. So they go based on their followers, they're not leaders. Meaning if somebody say, hey, let's hate so-and-so, and then they just follow. Instead of asking, whoa, what's going on here? Hold on. They don't do that. They just follow the, the herd. So who actually is involved in, in the conflict because it was more than just Ethiopia, wasn't it? The neighboring country with its Eritrea. How did they get involved? Okay, in 2018, Abiy Ahmed, the prime minister of Ethiopia, he got a Nobel Prize for creating peace between Ethiopia and Eritrea. I feel like he got the Nobel Prize to attack the Tigray people because he didn't create no peace. And the Eritreans, the president of Eritrea, which is Isaias Afawurki, he does have so much hate towards the Tigrayan people that he kept for a long, long time. He used that peace negotiation to destroy the Tigray people. When we talk about genocide, it's always about ethnic cleansing. That is what they're doing. And that is exactly what they're doing. Yeah. The prime minister advisor, he's a priest, is the orthodox priest. He literally told them that if you were to drop a drone in every city of Tigray, one by one, we could eliminate the Tigray people completely, wipe them out, and destroy them from the earth. That was their main purpose. And that's their reason. Yeah, they wanted to wipe it out completely. And these people are religious leaders. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Because, I mean, you're Tigrayan, but I've also noticed you're Christian. Yeah. Well, maybe there, maybe there are certain people in the church that don't really understand that. I don't know how God works. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> so. Now, a part of the genocide, of course, has also affected the population so badly, especially women and children. And we're hearing lots of reports of sexual abuse, rape, etc. Can you give us a little bit of an insight in, into what's happened there, especially with the children, because um, children should never suffer, and they are being made to suffer. Since it's been hap it happened two years ago, don't quote me for this, but because a lot there's a lot of things that happen within time, but they were told when the soldiers were getting interviewed, the Ethiopian soldiers and the Eritrean soldiers, they were told to rape the Tigran women and the Tigran children so they would never ever have another Tigran man. So this was an order, a military it, order? It is order. So it was purposely done. So they were told that if they rape them so they will not have a strong Tigran, you know, yeah. Women will not have a Tigran men, instead they will have somebody else. They, they, they were literally told by the government to go rape. The, and it's, it's sad because it's four years old. How do you rape four years old? And then 87 years old, how do you rape 87 years old? It just, it doesn't make sense. And there was one particular woman, it's very graphic. 
they raped her and they actually put nail in her private area. They put rock, they put a lot of things. And it was actually shown on CNN just a little bit. It's very graphic. And they were like, she asked them, why are you guys doing this? They were like, oh, we weren't, it's not that we want to do it, but we were told, make sure you guys don't rebirth another to Koreans. So it's, the number hasn't, we don't have actual statistic because of the blockage. So we really don't know how many, but I know that about a thousand of them have been raped and killed and harassed. So, yeah. Before we started recording, you also told a story which I find horrifying. Organ, stealing organs. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that as well, because this I find absolutely stunning. Again, don't call me on this because it's been <laughs> two years. But yeah, the Prime Minister of, Air, uh, not, the President of Ita, uh, Eritrea, which is Isaiah Saforgi, he actually told the soldiers to kill the young people and then he sells the kidney to other countries and he makes money out of it. So he was, the soldiers were literally told to kill any boy from seven years old and up any boy, as long as it's a boy. So a lot of women, what they were doing, they were hiding their kids. Yeah. So because it's, they were going door to door. That to me is absolutely stunning. I mean, you, you even mentioned that uh, China was, was buying some of these organs. Is that correct? Yeah, well, from what uh, the article from what say, yeah, From yeah. what we understand. From, from what we understand, but I really don't have the actual statistic of if it's true or not. Of but who, I, we, who is actually yeah, buying what. But, what, but from what I heard, yeah, that is correct. Oh, to me, it's more than sad, it's criminal. Yeah. It, it's, it's disgusting and it's criminal. There are two ways to fight a war. And unfortunately, what's happening in Ethiopia is there are no rules. They're making it up as they go. It's almost as if it's back to the Middle Ages, anything goes. Obviously, with the effect of the kids, what about schooling? I mean, that must be horribly affected now for uh, the Tigrayans. Yeah, school-wise, almost 85.5% of the schools are destroyed. Meaning, they took, actually, the Eritrean soldiers took most of it too. Because uh, Eritrea is close to Tigray. Mm -hmm. it, you could actually, it's not that far. You could take a bus or a car. Yeah. So they have literally deliberately took in the uh, laptops, the everything, the desk, everything, everything's gone completely. So there's nothing left for the Tigray people. We just have to start over. It's gonna take us maybe 20 or 10, 30 years to rebuild the whole region. Everything is demolished. They were taking yeah. school chairs and laptops. Blackboard, blackboards. Everything to Eritrea. This just gets worse and worse, doesn't it? Yeah. And I'm, I'm only smiling because I cannot believe what I'm hearing. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is terrible. Any idea how many people have died in this conflict? I would say close to a million, but we don't have a number because it's no, been again. blocked. And uh, the Ethiopian government, the Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, literally deliberately didn't want anyone to come and investigate. Even the United Nations did try and the, Uni the European Union tried, but he didn't want them. So maybe now, if they, you know, sometimes they hide it mm -hmm. after, if maybe now they could go and search and figure out how many people die and stuff. Because a lot of them have also, um, there's a lot of refugees in Sudan right now, close to 500,000 because of the war conflict. Right. Yeah, and uh, a lot of them, what the soldier would do is that kill them and then they throw them in the river. So we don't know how many. It, it's almost impossible to work to out how many out. have yeah. actually perished. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's also true of, we, we don't really understand how, how the children have been affected by all of this. Now we know they, they've got no schools, but I mean, they probably also have got no hospitals, no doctors. I, I suppose the list just goes on and on that they are lacking now in everything. Some of them, from what I heard, is that they were eating grass to survive because they didn't have anything, yeah. I know, I mean, one of, one of the, the charts we found here is that there was a talk here of, of 
you know, aid that's mm -hmm. coming into the country. And the white area here is the Tigray region. Mm -hmm. And the white means they had absolutely zero aid. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, his advisory, his name is Daniel Kapret. The reason why they did that, because they say, if we starve the Tigrayan people, and then they become weak, and the soldiers cannot fight. So that is why Abiy Ahmed, he literally blocked communication. Also, they were not allowed to get their money, too. Money, like bank, was closed for two years. Ah, okay. So you're not allowed to even take out your own money. So it's kind of bizarre. See, the thing about the starving, I mean, that reminds me of the Middle Ages when a castle would come under siege and, of course, the surrounding army tried to, you know, starve them out, basically. And here they're doing it with an entire region, not just a single castle. It is my understanding that the conflict has slowly abated and it's probably now not as bad as it was or has even stopped at the moment. Do you, do you agree with that? Based on, uh, like, you know, of course, the European Union or the, some of the news, yeah, they say stopped, but from what I heard, it's still the air train force is still in Tigray. They're not fully out yet. They're still there. So the Ethiopian government, Abiy Hamid, he's very, I mean, he's a liar. He's really good at it. He would say one thing today and he would change his words tomorrow. So he has to lie in order for him to get help from the United Nation or from the European Union because, you know, they get funds for the mm -hmm. country. Yes. So th they've been lying for the past three years. They even said for the past six months until CNN went there and saw, they deny saying that the Eritrean government soldiers, the soldiers were not in Tigray for six months. So it's kind of hard to believe what they say right now because they've been lying for too long. So I really don't know what's true so, and what's yeah, not we, true. We just don't know whether that's true know. or not. We just do not know. We do not know. We don't have an accurate answer. I mean, one would kind of hope that the, uh, the European Union, UK, America, etc., wouldn't do a thing until they had been allowed to visit and look at seeing what's happening, especially in Tigray. Yeah. Well, right now, the communication is open, and also people are allowed to fly to Tigray. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that they'll be able to go there and help the people. And also, Tigray needs justice. We deserve justice because, I mean, it's just, it's not fair. What, what happened is a genocide. Yes. And it should be somehow the Ethiopian government need to be accountable and responsible, own up to it, and and we lost a lot of family. Even I myself did, and a lot of people did. So mm -hmm. we didn't even have a chance to call and say, hey, sorry, you know, no, none of that. Yeah, because you didn't talk to your grandmother for, what, two years? Mm -hmm. Amazing. But you have spoken to her recently. Yeah, after January 1st, yeah. Okay. How, what sort of impression did she give you about what's happening at the moment? They're not allowed to talk about it because the phones are tapped. Oh, really? Yeah. So they're not allowed. Even if it's bad, they're not allowed to talk about it. So the government, yeah, it's open, but you're not allowed to say anything about the war because the phone is tapped. So you don't know who's listening. Got so, no idea who's listening yeah, and all so the rest of it. The only thing you could say is, how's everything? Whatever they say, okay. Right. Okay. Finally. How can we, the people, help the Tigrayans? The way you can help the Tigrayans, uh, it could be money. Also, I would love for anybody in America or anywhere in the world, like, you know, teachers and psychiatrists, therapists, counselors, if they could go there and volunteer, because we need that. Because right now, the whole Tigray, the whole region needs mental help. Yes. And they're really dysfunctional, you know. And they also each soldier that went to the war, the reason why they went to fight is because they lost family mem members from each household. Some of them lost like 13 wow. of their, like you know, parents, yes. siblings, and some of them lost five. I mean, so that is why they went to war. And these people, in order for them to be to live again, they need mental health, which is we need doctors. Also, we need doctors, 
we need food, we need money in order to survive. And education too, we don't have no school no. supplies. We don't have, they don't have anything in general. So we're starting over. Basically, they, they need to build everything from the ground up. Yeah, so I'm hoping people will help out with money or volunteer, they could go there. It's open right now, and the Tigray government is welcoming anybody that's willing to help and willing to do anything. It's just, you know, a little help will count. So I'm hoping that people will go there and visit and see what's going on and help the people to, it's not gonna be a year thing. It's gonna take at least 20 years. It's not something, because a lot has been damaged. I wouldn't be at all surprised if it didn't take longer because obviously, you know, what's happened in the Tigray region is going to be in living memory for it is. two, three, four generations mm -hmm. of what they suffered from their own government. I personally don't resonate with the word Ethiopia. I no. shrink when somebody say, are you from Ethiopia? Because we're not from, e yes, I am from Ethiopia. And again, I'm not trying to spread hate or anything, but I felt like I've been rubbed. Right. Because for me personally, uh, all the people that I was friend with, they were Ethiopians. None of them call or ask, see how I was like, doing or anything. And instead they were protesting and supporting the government to kill the Tigray people. So even friends of yours. Friends. I don't have I have no friends right now. I have zero friends. No, you got a friend here. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I'm saying is like from I know the exactly thing. What you I mean. have nothing because they all completely supported the government. And now one single person say, "Hey, you know, are you okay? Is you know, what's going on?" It's just it's kind of sad because and the reason why I'm sad because I went to Ethiopia in 2017 to 18 and I was volunteering and I was helping. And now the country, I'm in my 30s now, you know, it's kind of hard to create a different identity. Yes. So it's like I'm lost. What do I call myself? It's hard to resonate with the word Ethiopia. Yeah, when I see people, I say I'm from Ethiopia. I usually say I'm American because I am. but. It's just hard because the Ethiopians are against its own citizens. Yes. So how do you claim it? I don't know. You know, it's kind of strange. It's, it's it, you know, I come from Hampshire, a county in England, but I'm al I always say I'm a Brit because I am. You're Tigrayan, and that's what you're proud of. Yes. And you should be. And I have no hate towards Ethiopia because at the end of the day, the ground is still the same. The people are the problem. But it's just Well, that, the politicians are yeah, the problem. Yeah, and then the people who supported the politicians, they knew right from wrong. It has nothing, every time when you talk to another Ethiopian, they always blame TPLF, 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 which is Tigray Liberation Front. Right. But this has to do with humanity. We lost a lot of people. It really is a sad state of affairs. And I, I just hope that people that watch this can spread the news about this and, and hopefully we can start getting some donations coming in and uh, do a little bit to help. Definitely. Really and I, I honestly, humbly, I do appreciate it. I am grateful to be here. I wouldn't take it for granted. And it's a lot. <laughs> a lot has happened. Yes. And my mind is racing too. <laughs> But I'm hoping people will understand. And if they need more information, they could always contact, you know, they could always go to my Facebook, which is Pertuna Hylomarium. And then uh, if they need more inf information, I'll be able to help them out. But yeah, I, I mean, the people need our help. And right now we are under famine. Yes. Almost 2.5 million children are under literally Famine. Living in famine yeah, so, conditions. Yeah. I don't understand why American media wasn't on top of this right from day one, and they should have been. Closing on a, on a small note, one of the comedians I always enjoyed was Red Green. Red Green had a very famous saying, we're all in this together. It's about time people around the world suddenly understood, we are all in this together, let's just get on. Fix things that are really broken. Anyway, I'm Nigel Aves, your host. Thank you very much for watching this show. 
Don't forget to hit the old subscribe button that you'll see in the uh, bottom uh, right hand side of the screen. Until the next time, signing off. Goodbye.